All right, so we've seen the body of man as far as the three parts of man. We've seen the body. We've seen the soul. And the third part of man, see, is the spirit of man, the spirit of man. And this would be uh, number three underneath the tripartite being of man, the spirit of man. What is the meaning of spirit? The meaning of spirit. Let's get some space on the board here and uh, <clears throat> we'll go over this. With regard to the spirit of man, Uh, let's look at three things, the meaning, the usage, and the connection between soul and spirit in scriptures. All right, so first, the meaning of spirit. <clears throat> the, the word spirit, or the, the word spirit, is that unique part of man which uh, relates to God. So the meaning of spirit is a part of us that relates to God. John 4.24 is a descriptive verse along this line. John 4.24, the Bible says, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. In other words, God is a spirit. He's not flesh. He's not material. He's not corruptible. So God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Must worship Him in spirit and in truth. It's interesting with this very doctrinal description of God, God is a spirit. What follows that up is the way that we worship God. So is our worship important? Is the way that we worship is the means by which we worship God important? I think so. I know so. The Bible here puts this very doctrinal description of God side by side with how to worship Him then. We must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So we're looking at the three parts of man. We're looking at the body. We're looking at the soul and we're looking at the spirit. Worship that pleases God or worship that must be given to God is worship that comes through the Spirit. There's a lot of so-called worship today and, practically speaking, worship music today that worships God through the body. And uh, the reason that's the case is because that is the tool and that is the appeal of uh, country music and rock music and uh, blues and jazz is an appeal to the body. And uh, just because we put Christian words laid over top of music that appeals to the body doesn't make it Christian music. And so when we are looking at John 4.24 and we're having this command, we must worship Him in spirit and truth, we should understand that... Uh, uh, we're not worshiping Him in soul. Okay, part of the souls are flesh. Much music today is an appeal to the flesh. Now, <clears throat> um, the body can be surrendered to God, and the soul and its contents, the heart, the mind, the will, the conscience, can be surrendered to God, and controlled by the Holy Spirit and uh, the spirit and man that, uh, that, uh, wor that uh, relates to God. Okay? But the worship of God is spiritual. So when we have an avenue of worship, such as music, and its obvious appeal 
its obvious appeal is to the body, uh, to the flesh. Um, <clears throat> we know that we're not worshiping God in the way that He has told us in John 4, 24, that we must worship Him. Now, there's a lot of defense for those that take Christian words and, and lay them over top of secular music or worldly music or music that just sounds like the world, the world's music. Though There's so many arguments, you'd run out of space on this board and they'd argue, want to argue with you all day long. We don't really need to argue real long. We need to understand that God made man three parts, body, soul, and spirit. And the spirit's the part that relates to God and if we're going to worship God, we're going to worship Him in spirit and in truth. The way the world appeals to someone when they're producing music is not acceptable worship. Um, is not acceptable worship to God. Okay. Um, you can listen to music. And if you come away with music that makes you f feel good, watch out. Now, can godly music make a spirit-filled person feel good? Yes, it can, because our feelings, our emotions are a part of our soul. And if our soul is surrendered to God, that's, that's great. But to use a vehicle of the world and to put God's words in that vehicle and say, this is God music and this is music that pleases God, you're fooling yourself. That's the deceit of this world. Uh, the worship wars are alive and well. There's a book about that. They started several years ago. And churches said, well, you know, we need to have two services. We need to have the, the traditional service first, and then after that we'll have the contemporary service. Some have even gone so far as to say, uh, our services are blended worship. Well, see, by even doing that, they understand that there's two types of worship going on. And um, uh, so uh, use John 4.24 and, and, and keep, uh, keep this uh, aspect and this issue clear in your mind. Those that worship Him, our God, must worship Him in spirit. And in truth. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. Romans 8, 16. The Bible says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so here we see a difference between the spirit um, of man, our spirit, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, they interact together. The Holy Spirit bears witness or, or recognizes or knows the truth of the fact that uh, our, with our spirit that we are the children of God. One of the ways that you know that you're in the family of God and a child of God is if your spirit bears witness with the Holy Spirit. He will do that. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And uh, so uh, let's look also at 1 Corinthians 14, 14. 1 Corinthians 14, 14. Here we see, for I, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will sing with the Spirit. And I will sing with the understanding also. So here's our spirit again in worship um, in a way that pleases God. So the meaning of spirit, it's the unique part of man that relates to God. Number two here, the second point with regard to the spirit of man is its usage in Scripture. Its usage. Okay, the meaning, and now the usage. So we have five uses for the word spirit, five ways that the word spirit is used uh, in the Bible. So number one, the first way, of course, is the Holy Spirit, that third member of the Trinity, that person, the Holy Spirit. We find that in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, and plenty of other passages. 
So the word spirit can refer to the Holy Spirit. Uh, secondly, uh, is the spirit of man. The spirit of man, one of the, one of the three parts of man, the spirit of man. Job chapter 32 and uh, verse 8, Job 32, 8. Uh, the spirit of man, Job 32, 8. But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Spirit of man, Job chapter 32, verse 8. Third usage for the word spirit is described in Hebrews chapter 1, 14. And this is the ministering spirits or the angels. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14 says this, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So the ministering spirits or the angels. Fourth use for spirit is um, evil spirits or devils. These are described uh, many places in the Gospels in particular, but uh, take a look at Mark chapter 5 and verse 13. Mark chapter 5 and verse 13. Here we see, And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, so the spirits here, collectively named legion, um, make a request to um, enter into swine. And verse 13, Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea, about 2,000, and they were choked in the sea. So evil spirits. So the word spirit is used in what ways in the, in the New Testament? One's the Holy Spirit. Secondly is one of the three parts of man, the spirit of man. Thirdly are the ministering spirits or angels. Fourthly, uh, evil spirits or devils. And uh, then... Um, Number five, the fifth way the word spirit is used, it's used to describe an attitude of the mind. So uh, Philippians chapter 1 and verse uh, 27. Philippians 1, 27. There the Bible says this, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So here it's an attitude of, of uh, body or of mind, and uh, several Old Testament passages point that out as well. So the meaning of spirit, it's the part of man that relates to God. We must worship God with this part uh, of ourselves, our spirit. The usage of spirit, we see five different ways that the word spirit is used in Scripture. And then uh, next, or lastly here, is the connection, the connection between soul and spirit in the Bible, the connection between soul and spirit. <clears throat> there are times when the spirit is equated with one of the other parts of man. So Deuteronomy 2.30, let's take a look there. Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 30. Deuteronomy 2.30, But Sion, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him, for the Lord thy God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate. So hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate. So here, the spirit is equated with the heart. Okay, and we categorize the heart uh, underneath uh, the um, soul uh, of man. So here, spirit and heart are uh, parallel. And then um, there's a time when the spirit is equated with the soul. Look at 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 5. 1 Kings chapter 21 and verse 5 where the heart is equated with the soul. But Jezebel's wife came at him and said, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And uh, so here we have this emotion shown. Um, here the sadness, this emotion, uh, is part of the soul. And um, 
spirit is equated with that. And then 1 Corinthians 6.20, thirdly, the spirit is equated with the body. 1 Corinthians 6.20. 1 Corinthians 6.20. So this is the connection between the soul and the spirit in, in scriptures. First, uh, Second Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 6.20. Get there. 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 6.20. For you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So body and spirit, we see, a, we see an interaction between the body and the spirit. Both are to glorify God. So there's a connection between the soul and the spirit in scriptures and between the spirit and the body as well. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, we see then the nature of man. Uh, we believe uh, man is made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. We looked at today the soul, and we looked at the components, the heart, the mind, the will, the conscience, and the flesh. Uh, we uh, looked uh, then at the spirit. We looked at the meaning of the spirit. We looked at the usage of Five different ways the word spirit is used in Scripture. And then we looked at the connections that we see in Scripture between the spirit and the soul and the body. Much more to say about this. Of course, uh, any one of these uh, systematic theology classes, just due to the nature of them, um, are uh, surveys, even in themselves. Uh, there's much more that has been written and could be said about each of these areas. Um, but it's important to nail these things down and to see uh, the distinctions between them uh, and then be better pre prepared to know ourselves. When we're studying anthropology, doctrine of man, we're studying about ourselves uh, so we know um, where we're at and, and uh, uh, how to um, live in a way that pleases God. All right, <clears throat> now uh, we're going to look next at... Uh, Roman numeral number three, the fall of mankind. So uh, I'm going to clear off the board here uh, with regard to uh, uh, the body, the soul, and the spirit and uh, get into the fall of man. Really one of the saddest accounts in Scripture is the fall is the fall of man. Very sad, um, sobering account. Um, but with regard to the fall of, of mankind, um, we see several things <clears throat> uh, that I'd like to look at it in, in, this, in this structure. First, we'll look at the environment that the first man was in. Then we'll look at the responsibility given to the first man. And then we will see and hopefully learn a little bit about the tempter of the first man. So with regard to the fall of mankind, his environment, his responsibility, uh, and his tempter. And then after that, we'll see the, the uh, actual fall of uh, that first man. So <clears throat> the environment... Secondly, the responsibility. Third, the tempter. And then the actual fall of that first man. So the fall of man. Sobering account. Um, and uh, uh, one of the benefits of studying the fall of man is that we can learn the tactics of the same one who's our adversary today. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it's interesting that the techniques of Satan have never changed. They're the same. Uh, for some reason, man comes along and believes that he's 
got it figured out that uh, he won't fall. And I'm different. Yeah, Adam and Eve, they found I'm different. Uh, he uses the same techniques today. We're not ignorant of his devices. At least we shouldn't be. So as we go through this fall of man, yes, we're studying for the historical significance of it and for the, uh, how it permeates all of, uh, uh, all of uh, every human being on this earth, Romans 5.12. But, but look at it a little, look at it personally. Consider yourself, the Bible says, lest you also be tempted. So... We're going to go here to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis, the book of beginnings, and a wonderful book to study. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, and uh, we're going to look at the environment of the first man, and we're going to see four things about the environment. It was perfect, it was attractive, it was nourishing, and it was sinless. That's the first environment that man was placed into. Perfect, attractive, nourishing, and sinless. Uh, Genesis 2, 8 and 9. And the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there He put the man whom He had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So we learn some things from this uh, these two verses, this was a perfect setting. This was a place God prepared for man, a special place. Uh, number two, it was an attractive setting. It was pleasant to the sight, verse 9. It was a nourishing setting. In other words, uh, it was a place for food, and all the food that man needed was in this place, in this setting, in this environment. And it was sinless setting. So what we learn about this setting is this. The situation in which the first man was placed could not by any reasoning have been a contributing cause of his failure, as says Schaefer in his systematic theology. Uh, and so what we find is although the environment was perfect, man still fell. Uh, people today have sought to find utopia on this earth. I'm sorry, it's not here. Adam and Eve had it. They still fell. They still sinned. Um, so <clears throat> our environment is not the problem. The environment was perfect. It was attractive. It was nourishing. And it was sinless. Secondly, into this environment, perfect, man was placed with a responsibility. Responsibility. And uh, this was going to be his test. Ro uh, Genesis 2, 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So into this perfect setting, God gave man his test, his probation. Well, in this setting, in this responsibility, there was to be fellowship with the Creator. God wanted and expected fellowship. Uh, aside from the task of dressing and keeping the garden, uh, during that time period was this time of fellowship and satisfaction with his creator. Um, Adam did the will of God. It's a time of fellowship. And so he dressed the garden, he kept the garden, he did his, took care of his physical responsibilities. And along with that was this unbroken fellowship with God. Underneath this point, let's note the fact that there was, it was necessary that man have a test in this perfect setting as well. Okay? It was essential for God to place the simple test before Adam. Again, let's look at this test. 
Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And so this test is given because God is showing man that he has a will. God created man with a will. Uh, if there was no test, then God would have created robots. But God didn't want fellowship with robots. God wanted fellowship with man exercising his will who chose to fellowship with him. If God created man without a will and a choice, then he was no better or different than the animals. So we learn something about God by what he created. He's a fellowship-seeking God. He doesn't desire slavish, instinctive devotion from man. No, he wanted a want-to type of fellowship. You've probably fellowshiped, you've probably spent some time with people that you know inside they're fellowshipping with you because they have to. It's a, I have to do this. That's not very, um, it's not very good fellowship. We really can't even call that fellowship, can we? So we learn something about God by the man that he created. He created Adam with a free will. And part of that free will was a test of that free will. Why did Adam have a free will and why was there a test? Because God is a fellowship seeking God. That's who our God is. So man had to be given the opportunity to choose. Through his creation, man had a holy nature. But his character was going to be tested. Character is developed through the exercise of the will as man chooses to do right. And this test had a simple measure. And the, the test was measured very simply. Obey or disobey. And it was narrowed down to one tree. There's only one tree that could have been taken from that was uh, the tree of disobedience. Now, it's interesting that that tree is very clearly described by God. In other words, he's not tricking Adam. He's not trying to get him to fall. <laughs> uh, the opposite is true. And, and the one place of disobedience, the one forbidden tree, is very clearly stated by God. Adam was without excuse. We are without excuse. So what's the measure of the, the probation or the measure of the test? Simply, it's obedience or disobedience. So we see this here in Genesis 2, um, 16 and 17. Then after that, for the remainder of this chapter, Jesus or God describes to us here uh, by the pen of Moses, interestingly enough, uh, how that uh, God made Adam a helpmeet. And uh, undoubtedly, Adam passed along to his helpmeet, Eve, the uh, stipulation that they were under in the garden. Uh, and that is uh, to freely eat of all the trees ex except for one. God wanted them to want his fellowship over everything. And that's when, <clears throat> let us see, the tempter comes along. Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Stop. Hath God said, Question authority. That's the motto of the tempter. Hath God said. First thing that the Satan comes along 
and uh, presents to Eve as a question. Interesting. So <laughs> let's look here at the tempter of the first man in three areas. Uh, let's look at his identity. Let's look at his veracity or the truthfulness um, of his existence. And then let's look at his approach, which I just started to get into. All right, so let's look at the tempter in these three areas, his identity, his veracity, and his approach. So in the Genesis account, the um, serpent is... Um, uh, he's, he's given the title, the serpent. Uh, we see this here in verse 3. We see it's, uh, it's, it's a, uh, we see he's subtle. He's a subtle uh, serpent. Um, <clears throat> we see the term serpent show up uh, in 2 Corinthians when it, he's described um, further and in Revelation chapter 12. So let's look at the identity here of this tempter. And he's described as a serpent, the serpent. Let's now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 11, 3. Second Corinthians 11, <clears throat> verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And so this subtlety, this craftiness of the serpent. And uh, the serpent beguiled Eve, deceived Eve. So he's identified here by Paul in 2 Corinthians um, as a beguiling and deceiving uh, serpent. Uh, <clears throat> let's look at Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9. Revelation 12, 9. Here the Bible says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So here we have in one verse a linking together of the serpent with the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And uh, so here is uh, <clears throat> a description of the devil as the old serpent, or we could say the serpent of Genesis chapter 3. So his identity. Uh, this serpent we know here is representative of Satan, the devil, our adversary. And uh, we've got three then historical views of Satan. See, this idea of a real adversary, a real devil, it's a little too much for people that uh, don't believe in the inspiration and the preservation of Scripture to handle. It's a little too much. And so, for some, they take this passage, Genesis chapter 3, like much of the rest of Scripture, and they treat it as a myth. Uh, this is just a fictional account. This didn't really happen. There's not talking serpents, and uh, this little event that happened couldn't so dramatically have affected all of mankind. This is a myth. And that's the old line liberalism that would take anything supernatural in Scripture and, uh, and uh, um, just marginalize it as a fanciful stories, not a real historical account. Another view of Satan is that this is an allegory. So this is um, blending together of reality and um, uh, um, symbolism. And uh, this is an absurd um, position to say that uh, some of this is true and some of it is uh, simply a spiritual application, a myth, an allegory. But it's ways to get around. It's simply man's ways, unbelieving man's ways to get around dealing with uh, 
the source and the nature of sin and the fall of man. See, modern society, modern um, education, um, modern, um, uh, again, psychology, uh, um, and uh, they reject the fall of man because if man fell, then man has a sin nature. And that goes against their philosophy and their understanding that man is basically good. That goes against it. Uh, so man can't be basically good and yet be fallen and have a sin nature. And so <clears throat> we're left with one last choice if we're to be honest and um, if we're to be um, uh, faithful to Scripture, and that's this, that this account is literal. This is a literal account of exactly what happened. Um, subsequent historical record in Scripture proves that this passage was to be viewed literally. It's referenced throughout Scripture. And so this account is taken as literal all the way down to the time of Paul in Romans 5. Uh, Paul points back to this event and he treats it as a literal event. It really truly did happen. It's not something that's uh, a supposition or it's not an allegory. It's not just a story. It's definitely not a myth. Christ verified the reality of the people that are involved. Christ verified the reality of these people. Look at Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 and 5. Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 and 5, and here we see Christ uh, dealing with uh, this issue, Matthew 19, 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. And so here Jesus quotes from Genesis chapter 2, as though it is a historical fact that Adam and Eve lived. Of course he would see the Bible this way. Uh, so... Uh, we see here um, uh, the Scripture uh, treats this literally. Christ, as a part of Scripture in Matthew 19, treats this account literally as well. So his veracity, is he real? You bet he's real. Is this account true? Absolutely. It's just as true as John 3.16 is true. And then we see... The approach of Satan, his approach. What's his technique? What's his tactic? What ploy, what scheme, what device uh, did the devil use against Eve? If we can learn this, if we can learn Satan's approach to Eve and then to Adam, we can learn how he approaches us today. Four ways. Number one, it was through subtlety through subtlety. He is always a suspicious, sneaking foe. You know, he didn't come up and tell Eve, ah, God's a liar. <laughs> he came up and he dropped a seed into her mind, and that seed was in the form of a question. And that seed in the form of a question was something to get Eve to doubt. Just a seed just a question. Hey, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that this is uh, what's going to happen. But you, did, did God say? Did God say that? Subtlety, suggestiveness. Number two, suggestiveness. Subtlety, suggestiveness. Did, did God say that? Doubting God's words? Doubting God's words? Why are there so many types of Bibles today? Because doubting God's words. Why do many people today simply reject the Bible altogether? Doubting God's words. Who started that? Who initiated that technique? Doubting God's words. Now, if we could go back today, we would say, Eve, you shouldn't even be responding in kind to the devil. You're engaging him. He's getting you to doubt God's words as soon as the doubt for God's words placed. You ought to reject, reject 
that person, reject that statement, reject that proposition. Doubting our Creator. Eve did that. Why? Satan suggested it. Selectiveness. His approach was subtle. It was suggestive, and it was selective. In other words, it's alliterated, four S's, and what this selectiveness has the idea of this. It's trying to separate Eve from her authority. See, he's building up a case against God with Eve, and Eve falls for the trap. See, the devil is pulling Eve away from God, her authority. So here's Eve in fellowship with God, Satan, subtle, he suggests, he plants these seeds of doubt. And Eve is getting further. The more she engages Satan and listens to his reasoning, the further removed she gets from her authority, from God. And then also, Satan used the attack of sight. Look at what you see, Eve. Let's look back there at Genesis chapter 3. Let's pinpoint this technique. Let's see what Satan's doing. Verse 1, Hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree, every tree of the garden? And the woman said, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it lest ye die. Men have pointed out the fact that uh, God didn't talk about not touching it, but Eve now is a little bit more separated from God. She's listening and engaging Satan, and now God becomes a little bit more strict than uh, what he actually was in the sense that, hmm, maybe he is unjust. That's, that's really harsh. That's really strict. <laughs> Satan knows that he's got Eve separated from God enough in verse 4 that he says, Ye shall not surely die. Let me tell you, let me tell you what you're going to benefit if you follow what I'm telling you to do. Let, let me tell you all the good things you're going to get. Let me tell you all the fun you're going to have. Think about this, Eve. God knows, uh oh, the devil is telling Eve what God knows? God's holding something back from you, Eve. Boy, that's the way it goes today in the world, often with young people. You know, you're not getting everything out of life. You're not able to live life to the fullest by serving God. I mean, how square is that? I mean, think about all the stuff you're, you're never going to get another chance to live this life to the fullest. So why don't you just dive in and follow your heart? Do what feels right. For God doth know, he's holding back on you, Eve, that in the day ye eat thereof, then shall your eyes be opened as though now they're closed. In other words, you're not seeing everything you could see, Eve. No, that's true. The devil wants to come along and find a young man and get him to say, you know what? There's some other stuff you could be seeing if you're not following God. Don't you want to see that? What a subtle approach. For God doth know that in the day ye eat there, that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The garden lies, three garden lies, three lies in the Garden of Eden that Satan perpetuates to this day. Number one, deathlessness. You shall not surely die. Deification. You shall be as gods. And number three, secret knowledge. Knowing good and evil. Secret knowledge. Come join our lodge and you'll get secret knowledge. Come join our Scientology church, and there we will introduce to you secret knowledge. Come join the Mormon temple, and there, the longer you stay in, we will take you and we will present to you secret knowledge. Deathlessness, deification, 
secret knowledge, the garden lies. And these lies have been perpetuated since this time. This is the establishment of Satan's religion. This is the establishment of Satan's religion, which is the only alternative to God's revealed truth. In the garden, Satan's religion was established. Deathlessness, deification of man. Man is basically good. Man is good. The Bible says uh, all are sinners. The devil says man is good. The deification of man. Secret knowledge. God is holding back good things from you. Hmm. How many people do you know have fallen for those lies? His approach, it's subtle. It's suggestive. It's selective, and it's based on sight. See, <clears throat> we see a parallel to this, these truths, in 1 John chapter 2 and uh, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, Hmm. The garden lies, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The garden of Eden lies still today are the tool of Satan. Not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, the tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave to her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. Shame is actually the result of sin. And they tried to cover it up themselves. They sewed fig leaves together. They tried to cover their shame and hide their sin, and then hide from God. Hmm. And Adam comes and finds, or God comes and finds Adam. And um, so we have then the fall of the first man, and we'll pick up uh, with that the next time, the fall, fall of the first man. So this will be the last point with the fall. So with the fall, we have the environment, <clears throat> We have man's responsibility. It's a test. God created, God is a fellowship-seeking God, and He created man to, to, to fellowship with Him. And so that required a test. That's the tree. We learn about the tempter, his identity, his veracity, and his technique, his approach. And then we'll see then the sad account of the results of... Um, of this fall.